Hi everyone, this is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome to our newest podcast, Striker Talks. Few companies in the medical device industry touch the entire spectrum of healthcare like Striker. From accident scenes to ERs, from ORs to patient rooms, Striker delivers the supplies, tools, and devices used to provide patients with the highest quality of care. In this podcast, we'll talk with the company's leaders to gain a better understanding of how innovation, new technologies, and teamwork will further Striker's mission. Let's go. This is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Striker Talks podcast. In this episode, I had the great pleasure of speaking with Annie Heath. Annie Heath is Striker's Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And in this conversation, we'll talk about Annie's career, how she found her way into the DEI office, and why it's so important to her. Of course, we'll talk about what Striker is doing in this area. It's three commitments to building diversity in the workplace, and also it's supplier base and beyond in healthcare. So, and it was a, a treat to talk to, and I know you'll enjoy this conversation. But before we begin this interview, I'd like to bring in our sponsor, Acuity MD. I'm speaking with Mike Monavukas. He is co-founder and CEO of Acuity MD. Mike, tell us about Acuity MD. Acuity MD is a software company that provides a commercial platform for medical device and medical technology companies. You know, we're a, we're a startup. We're about three years old. We work with over 70 medical device companies. We've grown 4X over the last year. So scaling quickly in this, in this space. And, you know, what we provide is a targeting platform that helps medical device companies get their products out to market more efficiently. You know, getting patients access to new technologies, as you know, requires engaging a complex and changing landscape of stakeholders. The surgeons, the hospitals, IDNs, GPOs, payers, distributors, you know, selling medical devices is very different than selling industrial goods, software, even pharmaceuticals. And we want to build a software platform that helps and empowers commercial teams to, to better uh, commercialize their products and get them out to market. So our mission at AQDMD is to accelerate access to, to medical technology. And we're working with about 70 medical device companies to do so through our software and, and, and data platform. Well, that's great. We'll learn more about Acuity MD from Mike Monavukas a little later in the podcast. If you need more information right now, go to Acuity MD's website. That is acuitymd.com. That's A C U I T Y M D.com. Well, Andy Heath, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so grateful to be a part of this. Oh, you're very kind. I'm grateful you're sharing your, your story, and it's a, an unusual one. Well, we'd like to take a little time to find out about uh, a person's career path and how they found their way into the medtech industry. So, anyway, what first interested you in the medtech industry, and what was your start? Yeah, you know, like so many people that you've talked to on this podcast, I fell into med device. I graduated with a degree in business with a focus on marketing. Okay. And quite honestly, had every intention of going into sales. I thought that's what I wanted to do with my life at that time. And Stryker was recruiting at the college that I was at. And so I thought, well, I'm going to give this a shot. And interestingly enough, I started in an operations role. I was going to so say, I, you know, they do have sales at, at Stryker. It's they like... do. <laughs> we do. But I decided to take a leap of faith and awesome. went into this operations role. And I think what drew me to Stryker and to healthcare was the people that I met. I genuinely enjoyed everyone I had the chance to talk to. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to give this a shot. If this doesn't work out, I'll go to sales later. And I spent 20 years in operations. That's and amazing. so I loved my career in operations. My last role was leading five of our manufacturing plants for the endoscopy division. And I absolutely loved it. I loved the ability to work with diverse teams. I loved being able to supply product to our customers. And it just really fulfilled a big part of who I am, which is really being able to lead and grow and develop diverse teams. 
That's interesting. Uh, and, and I'm curious as to how you have observed the difference between the path you might have taken and the path you took. What would a life in sales look like versus a life in operations? I'm imagining in operations, you're, you're dealing with more internal connections within Striker, maybe more organization where sales, you're kind of more out there hunting and gathering and supporting, and it's a little more uncertain. Yeah, I think there is a little bit more uncertainty, although I think sales is still incredibly fun. I think, you know, my strengths really lended itself really well to operations. I think I was probably a little more analytical than I gave myself credit for when I was 18. (laughs) And so I, um, you know, just truly enjoyed being able to deliver for our customers. And honestly, what I really loved was being able to lead diverse teams. And ultimately, it's what got me into the DEI space. You know, I made a major career change after 20 years in operations, jumping into DEI, and I feel really grateful and fortunate that Stryker took a chance on me to get to have the second career within Stryker. That's great. I want to get into that in a moment, but I know this is the Stryker Talks podcast, so it sounds like I'm playing to the home team. But of the many people I've interviewed in MedTech, I think Stryker just in my head has more people who have stayed with the company the entire time. Certainly there's been other instances, but what is it about Stryker that kept you there? And what secrets would you give to someone who's in her or his early twenties at the company and they want to, they want to stay there? What worked for you in terms of finding new opportunities and growing at the rate you wanted to grow? It's a really interesting question because I don't know that I ever set out to be in an organization for, I'm, I just celebrated 23 years. <laughs> and so I, you know, still feels like yesterday to be quite honest. Sure. I think, you know, for me, it's really been twofold. I have always felt challenged. I have always felt there's more for me to do than I have time for. Mm-hmm. And I think that what I would say to younger folks really entering the workforce is that you have to find something that challenges you in a way that really matches your strengths. And I think that that keeps you engaged. You know, it keeps you really thinking differently. It helps you grow and develop as an individual. But I would say equal to that, it's finding a culture and environment that you really enjoy and love being around. I feel very fortunate that I've gotten to work with some of my best friends. Work is not always easy. It's there are hard days inevitably, but your hard days are not so hard when you Mm -hmm. get to work with people that you just genuinely like being around. Have you moved geographically at all? You know, I'm born and raised in California and I've lived my whole life here. That's great. Well, I was born and raised in Massachusetts and I lived my whole life here, but California's <laughs> a bit bigger than Massachusetts. So yours is a bolder statement. All right, well, let, let's move into your new role. You became vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion on June 2022. Was this a, a new position being created or did you take over for, for somebody else? Yeah, we had this role in the organization. It just wasn't completely dedicated 100%. There was a there was a role in the organization that had kind of multiple aspects to it and DEI being one of those. And so in 2020, the role opened up as a as 100% dedicated to DEI and that was when I threw my name in to really get the opportunity mm-hmm. to have this major career shift. This space is a major passion of mine. It's something even in my operation days that I just, I loved really helping people reach their potential and really help them be their true authentic selves. And so it's a place that I find a tremendous amount of passion, both professionally and personally, to be quite honest. I have three children. I have three boys and my middle (laughs) son, they keep me busy. Yeah, I bet. um, But my middle son was born with a stroke. And so he has cerebral palsy Oh wow! and um, he is an amazing kid and is very fully functioning in so many ways, but he does everything one-handed. And so when you watch somebody through their eyes, especially through a child, just want to fit in, it really gives you a different perspective on things. And, you know, he's been so amazing his whole life. He's just very pragmatic about it all. And he's played all sports. He plays baseball, he plays basketball, and he does everything one-handed. And but I see in him, you know, at times he just wants to fit in. Yeah. Just, you know, when I mean we can all remember those days when we were kids. And, you know, ultimately you don't want to look different. Ultimately, you just want to be like everybody else. And so that's something that really changed me in a lot of ways. I feel like I've always been somewhat passionate in this space, but that probably amplified my passion. I never want somebody to feel as though they don't belong at Striker. 
And when we think about our culture and our culture of belonging, it is incredibly personal and, and something that I find incredibly important as we evolve as a company. Oh, I believe that. Nothing, you're, as you said, nothing really changes your perspective on life and can do so immediately than one of your children's experiences. It just uh, opens your eyes to a lot of things. We'll take a quick break from this conversation to bring back our sponsor, Acuity MD. Once again, I'm speaking with Mike Monavukas. He is CEO and co-founder of Acuity MD. Mike, tell us, how does Acuity MD work with medical device companies? So our journey started by building a targeting platform for med tech sales reps that automatically surfaces, prioritizes, and helps them act on new opportunities for the products they sell. We've harnessed billions of data points like procedural volumes, shifts in where surgeons operate, where surgeons were trained and who they trained under, and skew level pricing and inventory at at various facilities in, in the US. And then transform all these data points into insights to help a med tech rep get their products out to market more effectively and more efficiently. So our mission at Acuity MD is to accelerate access to medical technology. And we work with companies of all sizes and scales, including you know top five medical device enterprises, as well as sort of growth oriented companies that are newly commercial, have just gotten approval and are building their sales force uh, for the first time. That's great, Mike. And where do you see Acuity MD headed in the future? So as we learn more from our customers, we started to understand that Acuity MD could help connect the critical flywheel in the med tech commercial process. For example, how does a sales rep define and prioritize the opportunities to grow? How do they measure and execute on these opportunities? And how does the broader commercial team learn from the outcomes to better define and prioritize who they're targeting in the future? So for sales reps, this means a targeting platform that gets smarter over time and more responsive over time. As they're seeing success in certain market segments, the targeting platform adapts and gets gets smarter over time. As target surgeons get converted to using a certain product, as contracts and pricing changes, and as their clinical practices evolve, Acuity MD and the targeting platform shall also adapt and recommend increasingly relevant opportunities to grow the business. But the medtech commercial flywheel can connect all sorts of stakeholders in the medtech organization. Upstream marketing can better empathize with how product users are using certain products or not using certain products to understand white space clinical areas to prioritize. Downstream marketing can gain visibility into penetration across different segments and geographies and prioritize campaigns to support their field reps. National accounts can determine how changes in pricing can impact top line growth and coordinate with field reps to execute on changes in contracts. So you see the flywheel has the opportunity of building a better commercial platform for all these different stakeholders at the med tech company. And that's really what we're what we're building at, at Acuity MD is a commercial platform uh, to drive access and accelerate access to medical technologies for all the stakeholders at a medical device commercial organization. Fantastic. Great stuff from a great company. Thanks, Mike Monavukas, for joining us on the podcast and thank you AcuityMD for supporting this podcast once again if you'd like more information go to acuitymd.com I, I want to explore the position a bit more but I'm just kind of curious did, did the position become available and you applied did someone encourage you to apply and I would love to just sort of understand the internal process that led you to decide to apply because it would have been very easy just to say no I'm operations this is this is what I want to continue doing It's an interesting question. So yeah, the role was posted and I had reached out to my manager and said I was interested. I had always had a tilt toward this space, to be perfectly honest. So Mm -hmm. I had tiptoed in this space a little bit while in my operation days, I was the president of our women's network. I ran a diversity council for operations. So I had kind of this opportunity to tiptoe a little bit to see if I really liked it before I kind of went full steam. And so when this opportunity opened up, I did throw my name in and said, I really want to do this. I think this is really where my heart is and I'm ready for a change. And so I got incredible support from my leadership team, from our HR leadership team, and you know, feel very lucky that they were willing to take a chance on me to, to jump into this. So when you're talking to someone at a soccer field or wherever you might meet people nowadays and they ask what you do, what do you do? How do you define your position? That's an interesting question. I, I think I normally say that 
I'm responsible for the strategy of driving inclusion for Stryker. It's a small team. And so I alone cannot do it. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is the responsibility of everyone in the organization. So I feel as though my role is really to just help shape and guide and help develop our leaders in this space because it is it does take every single person to really make a difference in this space. So what does that look like to drive for, for inclusion? I imagine there's many different knobs. You want to bring new people into the organization. You want to ensure that the people who are in the organization feel supported. You want to help those same, anyone, everyone in the organization sort of climb and reach their full potential. That's a lot. <laughs> how do you how do you go about maybe you could kind of share your approach and 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 how you see sort of that unfolding? Right. I think the most important thing, first and foremost, is to align it to your mission and purpose. If you don't align these efforts to your mission and purpose, it can feel unauthentic. And I feel very fortunate that Stryker has really been rooted in driving, making healthcare better. And people have always been at the heart of what we do. So when we combined that, that sets our foundation. It's built into our strategy. It's what we think about and do every day. That's where I think it really then becomes authentic. So then from my perspective, it's really guiding the organization into what are our commitments in this space? What are we going to do to advance this journey at a faster pace? And our commitments are really, they're similar to most organizations. They're really, you know, we have three commitments as an organization. The first of these is strengthening the diversity of our workforce. The second is ensuring that we have a culture of inclusion and belonging. And then the third is really about maximizing inclusion to drive innovation and growth. And so with those guiding principles, we can align the organization to continue to push this journey forward while always being mindful of what we're doing is to effectively make healthcare better. So how do you measure success? Because we're, we're in an industry med tech where to demonstrate success, you have to have the numbers clinical trial wise or sales wise on the business side. How do you use numbers? Do you use numbers to measure your success? What kind of metrics do you use? We measure many, many things in this space, but I will comment on three because these are the ones that we primarily share externally. And we also share with all of our internal employees at our global town halls we are tracking our representation and we are committed to increasing representation at all levels. So we share our representation by race and ethnicity as well as gender at each level. And we want to see that moving forward year over year. And then we measure, the second place that we measure is our employee sentiment. So we want to know, do our employees feel a culture of inclusion and belonging? And is that equitable across different demographics across the organization? And so we leverage an external organization called Gallup to help us measure our employee sentiments. And so when we look at our inclusiveness index, we've made great progress in that space. And we're in the top 20% of companies within Gallup. And then the last place that we really look at from measuring is within our recruiting, we're going to continue to invest in recruitment and we measure our efforts through diverse slates. And we've seen some really amazing progress in that space. You know, we are about 70% of our slates have a diverse candidate on them. And, and that is translating to hires where we're seeing over 60% of offer accepts. What do you mean by a slate? What's a slate? So if we have a position that's open, then we want to make sure that we are interviewing all the best talent that could potentially be out there for an open role. So if we have an open position, we want to make sure at least one of those people being interviewed is from an underrepresented category. Gotcha. And then we're always going to select the best person for the job. To do that, do you both encourage people within to apply for things and externally to apply? Do you, are you looking yes, at both? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to look at both. Interesting. So speaking of externally, how is Stryker looking at partners, at suppliers? Is that fall under you or are you more of a workforce you kind of look at the workforce diversity and inclusion, or are you looking at the organizational diversity and inclusion as well? We look at all of it as an organization. We have a dedicated team that focuses in on supplier diversity. And so we look at you know our supply base and how we're collecting our parts and our products that we're bringing in from the outside and ensuring that we have a diverse supply base. But we also look at partnering with our customers you know, we know as a healthcare industry, we all need to get better. And we're committed to collaborating with our stakeholders to support the growth of diversity in healthcare. 
And there's, there's a few ways that, that we do that. We definitely partner with organizations like AOFAS, for example. We've been working with them, which is the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. And so we work with them to help them develop their programs. And then we've also openly worked with many of our surgeons to just help them in their journey. You know, they need help too in figuring out how they become more diverse. And so we have lots of conversations with them to just help them evolve in this journey. And then we also want to think about how do we positively impact the communities that we're in? And we launched an initiative in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where our headquarters is, what we call Career Right Here, which is an initiative to really impact the community around our headquarters to really drive them to careers within Kalamazoo and staying within the community. How about on the uh, on the patient side? Are you involved in any efforts to uh, boost healthcare equity to ensure people who aren't getting the best of care are getting the care that they need? Yeah, there's a couple of places in which we focus in that. You know, we focus, we do a lot of work with Operation Smile, and that's been a, a signature program for us as we think about equity across the globe. We also work with an organization called Project Cure. Okay. And then, you know, we are really close with AdvaMed and working with the AdvaMed Association and thinking about how we elevate equity across healthcare. Interesting. So what, uh, I mean, you, you've had this job for... Just are you closing in on a year? I'm trying to remember the date that you joined. Uh, June so 20... I started in I started in 2020, so it's just been a little bit over two years. Oh, okay. I thought it was 2022. I think I said 2022 earlier. So you started June 2020. Yep. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I mean, obviously, that immediately followed the murder of George Floyd and and, and the rush of energy that rightfully followed. It's interesting to me. Very often, horrible events like that do lead to an immediate push for change, and then the energy sort of tapers off. Yeah. I'm not sensing that here at all. It seems like not only striker, but industry-wide and I think society-wide, at least in this country, there's still, the, the push is just as strong. How, how do you see things from, from your perspective? If I think about it from a striker perspective and just how we approached it, I mean, those events do provide a catalyst for open and honest conversations. And I think it's imperative that we take advantage of those opportunities to be able to truly hear from our employees. And that was something that we were very mindful of during that time. You know, this has spurred a lot of conversations around well being and taking care of each other. And how do we navigate through all these things that are going on socially and be able to be a support to each other? And so I think there's there's a role of the organization to play an active part in supporting each other through all of these things that are going on outside in the world. So in that way, I do think it amplified some of our efforts, but I feel really fortunate to work for a company that this has been a priority for a very long time. And it is really true to who we are as an organization. And I think that's what will drive sustainable change over time is that we are really approaching this from an authentic space and continuing to move forward in what matters to our mission and purpose as an organization. Do you have any broader takeaways or, or lessons learned from the past two years or closing on three years? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I don't know where I think this COVID <laughs> year is going to blur. They do. Um, <laughs> I think the thing for me that I think is so important is this authenticity piece. I DE and I in general can be politicized and I understand. I understand why, and I understand that it, it is very intertwined. But ultimately, people just want to be seen, heard, and valued. And I go back to what brought my passion here in this space through watching my son just want to feel like he belongs. I think ultimately, that's we need to continue to focus and center on that, that at the end of the day, People just want to feel as though they're adding value to an organization, that their voices matter, and that they're seen for who they are. And I think if we keep that center stage, we will make tremendous progress in this space. I think sometimes when companies in general just lose sight of that, it just feels a little bit performative and doesn't feel authentic. So I think it's really important to stay aligned to your mission and purpose and remember that at the end of the day, everyone just wants to feel like they belong. Sure. You know, people can remember what it was like at some point in their life when they didn't feel like they belonged or 
you know, they kind of felt like an outsider. And so, you know, when we think about this journey and we think about the impact it can have, it is really personal. It is really making people feel as though they have a voice, they add value to the organization. And so that's what I think is the most important learning Mm -hmm. about this journey is that we can make statements, but ultimately we need to drive a culture where people feel seen, heard, and valued. Oh, that's great. Just final question, kind of a personal note. I'm curious, how do you see the world sort of accepting people with physical challenges like your son? Are you encouraged by the acceptance that you've seen? It's, I think it's better than it was when I, I know it's better than it was when I was growing up, but how, how do you see things? I think it's definitely getting better. When I see these younger generations, and again, my, my son's 14 years old now, so I have seen him kind of grow up with this generation and I feel like they're far more accepting. Mm-hmm, and too. so I think we will see it continue to change. I think technology has played a huge role in accepting of change. I mean, the things that my son is able to do with technology blows my mind. Yep. And I think that will open up doors for him in the future that who knows what he's going to be able to do. And I and so that gets me really excited about the potential of how we can accept people with all abilities in the future. Definitely some cause for hope. Well, this has been great, Annie. Thank you for for taking some time to uh, to share your story on the podcast. Thank you so much. It truly was a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Striker Talks podcast. Thank you, Acuity MD, for sponsoring this episode. Thanks again to Annie Heath for uh, making herself available. And thanks again to you for listening. Please do me a favor, uh, share this episode on social media. And when you do, tag me. I am on LinkedIn, Tom, S-A-L-E-M-I of Device Talks. Or you can also uh, share this on Twitter and find me there at MedTechTom. We'd also love you to subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network. Do that and you'll get upcoming episodes of the Striker Talks podcast sent directly to your listening device. You'll receive many of our other fine podcasts as well, including the Device Talks weekly podcast, our flagship. And of course, you can find all of these podcasts at devicetalks.com. Once again, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Striker Talks podcast. Tune in next time. We'll have another fantastic episode, I promise, coming to you through the Device Talks podcast. Network.